to welcome back to another video. I'm so glad that so many people responded to my last video. So many comments were there, it was fun to read. And a lot of people came up with the answer for this one right here. And I was glad that you guys got the right answer. And you took different ap approaches using different theorems. You could use whatever you like. And I'm going to show you guys how I solved this problem in the first place. So if you want to see any other approaches, take a look in the description. There will be a link to my last video and then you can browse the comment section. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So the first observation you could take is that in this triangle inscribed right here, we have three side lengths which are equal, equal to one. Well, what does that mean? That also means that all the inner angles must be the same. That's what you call an equilateral triangle. Okay, so the sum of all inner angles in a triangle does make 180 degrees. So that's pretty nice. We can make use of that. So 180 divided by 3 makes 60. So every angle is 60 degrees in here. So that's the first observation. So that's 60 degrees, that one is 60 degrees and also that one is 60 degrees. Next observation. So from this point right here to this point, for example A to B, we have a straight line. That means if you go for example from here to there, that angle right here is 180 degrees. So pi over 2. Um, but this angle right here is already 60 degrees. So in order for us to come to 180 degrees, that angle in this triangle must be 120 degrees. Okay, so that's nice. And here's another observation. We have this angle right here. And close to this angle there are two side lengths which are equal to one. That means this triangle right here is an isosceles triangle. What does that mean? Well, the other two angles must be the same. That's a condition for an isosceles triangle. So what are those other angles? Well, they have to make up 60 degrees in, in total in order for us to get to 180 degrees. So this one must be 30 degrees and also this one must be 30 degrees. And that's great. <laughs> Next observation. So we found out a lot of angles right now. Let's move on. So once again we have a straight line from this point to this point right here. And we have 30 degrees and 60 degrees. For in order to us uh, in order for us to get 180 degrees, we need 90 degrees right here. So that right here is indeed a right triangle. It doesn't look like one, it's supposed to not look like one. So that's a right triangle in here. Let's move on. What else can we observe? Well, we have a straight line from this point to this point. And we have 60 degrees here and 90 degrees here. That makes 150 degrees. So in order for us to get 180 degrees, we need an angle of 30 degrees in here. So that's nice. And now we have a lot of information and now we can move on with some computing. Okay, now we want to take a look at the law of signs. What does the law of signs say? Say um, we have a triangle right here, that's A, B and C. And we have some angle, um, let's say, I don't know. We have an angle alpha, angle beta. No, let's put it that way to make it more clear. Okay. And the law of sines does tell us that A over B is equal to the sine of alpha over the sine of beta. So that's what it does say. You can rewrite this a little bit. So that's equivalent to the statement that a over sine of alpha equals to B over sine of beta. So that's the law of sines and we can use that. Let's take a look at this triangle at first. What can we do with it? We are going to give this little side right here a name. Let's call it A for example. So this bad boy right here is now A, this straight boy. <laughs> And we can inscribe, uh, inscribe an angle in here. Let's call it phi, for example. And yeah, let's use the law of sines now. So we know x over the sine of 90 degrees. So x over the sine of pi over 2, let's put it that way, is equal to a over the sine of phi. 
exactly. But we can find another relationship. So let's, for example, say um, we want to take a look at this angle. For example, theta again. OK, then we can use the law of sines again. So we want to find an expression for A in this case. Hmm. What can we do? Well, we have that 1 over the sine of 30 degrees, which is just pi over 6 in this case, is equal to A over the sine of theta. That's nice. The sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. So that makes 1 over 1 half. So that's just 2. So this whole expression is just 2. So we can find an expression for A by isolating A in here. So that also means that A is nothing else than 2 times the sine of theta. That's nice. And sine of pi over 2, well, that makes just 1. So this is just 1. So x is equal to A over sine of phi. But what is A? A is just 2 times the sine of theta over sine of phi. <laughs> That's great. So we already found an expression for x, but can we do anything else? Well, we can. I wouldn't ask this, that question if we couldn't. So it would be nice to find an expression for theta somehow. How can we do that? Well, let's take a little observation. So we have a triangle from here to there to there. So this huge triangle. And the inner angles must be a sum that goes to 180 degrees. So 180 degrees, what is that? Well, we've got a theta, and also we get 60 degrees right here. So plus 60 degrees. And we also have 60 degrees plus phi in this case, plus 60 degrees plus phi. Well, we can add those together and subtract them on both sides. Then that's equivalent to 60 degrees is equal to theta plus phi. And we can isolate our theta. So that also makes 60 degrees minus phi is equal to theta. And we can plug this in here. And let's see what we get after that. So that means that x is now equal to 2 times the sine of 60 degrees, well, 60 degrees is just pi over 3, so that's pi over 3 minus phi over the sine of phi. I did it that way, so uh, isolating to get an expression for theta because um, we can use some angle formulas now and we can break this up so this fraction is additive. We are now going to take a look at some angle formula, at some difference formula. Okay. So since we have this expression right here, what can we do? Well, we can take a look, for example, uh, uh, at the sine of a minus b. So what's the sine of a minus b? Well, that is just the sine of a times the cosine of b minus the sine of b cosine of a. And we can make, make use of that. So we can use this identity in this case. So that also means that x is equal to 2 times. So at first we get pi over 3 as our a and phi as our b. So this is the sine of pi over 3 times the cosine of phi minus the sine of phi times the cosine of pi over 3 and this whole thing over the sine of phi. <laughs> OK, sine of phi. So how can we simplify any further? So you can calculate it in your head by hand or use your calculator. Cosine of pi over 3 would evaluate to 1 half in this case. So this is 1 half. And the sine of pi over 3 is just square root of 3 over 2. So this simplifies a bit. So we now have so this 2 and this 2 will cancel out. So that's square root of 3 cosine of phi over the sine of phi and, well, minus. So this 2 and the 1 half will cancel out. That will just be 1. And also we get sine of phi over sine of phi. So that's just minus 1 in this case. So that simplified pretty nicely. And, well, this right here is just the cotangent. So that's square root of 3 times the cotangent of phi minus 1. Now we have a little problem. We have this cotangent here. So can we find an expression 
for our cotension. And this comes in pretty handy, but we have a right triangle here. And now we can use Pythagoras theorem for that. So that means that x squared, since that's the hypotenuse, is just 1 squared plus a squared. And that also means, well, we can isolate a, for example, later on. Because if we want to take a look at the cotangent of phi, that's nothing else than adjacent over opposite. So this is 1 over a. So we have to isolate for a. So a is nothing else than, well, this is x squared minus 1 squared, taking the square root. That's a positive number. It's supposed to be a positive number because that's representing a length. So this is 1 over square root x squared minus 1. And that's nice. That's an expression for the cotangent. So we can plug this in. So all in all, this is square root of 3 over square root x squared minus 1 minus 1. Whew. And now we are nearly done. Now we only have to solve for x, doing some algebra. So how can we do that? Well, we can add 1 on both sides, and then we can multiply both sides by square root x squared minus 1. So let's do this at first. So that's equivalent to x minus 1 times the square root of x squared minus 1, and this is now square root of 3. But those roots are kind of annoying. What can we do? Well, we can square both sides, for example, and we can still solve for x. This will give us the same answer. So if we square both sides, that's a square and that's a square, what do we end up with? That means that we get x squared minus 2x plus 1. Um, x minus 1? Yeah. Uh, no, x plus 1, I'm sorry. x plus 1? That would be stupid. So this is x plus 1. We get this expression, this right here. And also we get x squared minus 1. And this is going to be equal to 3. OK, now we can distribute everything into everything. So that's equivalent to saying we get um, x to the fourth power. And then we get 2x to the third power plus x squared. And then minus x squared. So this will cancel out. Minus 2x minus 1. And this is equal to 3. We can add a 3 on both sides, so uh, we can subtract it on both sides, so this makes minus 4. And now we can do some factoring. And we are going to do this factoring by grouping things up. This is now equal to 0. So we want to find the zeros of this function. So that comes in pretty handy. So I'm going to go here. We still have our expression. And we can rewrite this a little bit. So if you take a closer look, we could factor out an x cubed on here. So this is x cubed times x plus 2. And we want to get another x plus 2 so that we can factor it by grouping. How can we do that? Well, if, if we factor out a minus 2 on here, that would give us the desired expression. So that's minus 2 times x plus 2. Well, that's nice. And this is still equal to 0. Hmm. Now we can factor out this x plus 2 because it's a common factor of those two. So that's equivalent to saying x to the third power minus 2 times x plus 2 is equal to 0. And well, now we have our condition for um, our side length x. So let's see what does make sense. This expression should be equal to 0. So x plus 2 is equal to 0. That makes x is equal to minus 2. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't represent a length in our Euclidean space. So that right here isn't a possible solution. Now let's take a look at that. So that's x to the third power minus 2. We are going to bring this 2 to the other side. So x to the third power is equal to 2. <clears throat> and now we can take the third root. So that means that x is equal to 2 to the 1 third, the cube root of 2. And that right here is actually the solution. We are only going to take a look at the real branch of this thing. We are not going to take a look at the complex solutions because complex solutions aren't allowed in here. So we are only looking for real solutions. So that's the solution. We've done that. And congratulations to the guys who also found it out. I thank you guys for your great cooperation. And if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And recommend me if you like. And well, if you want to support me a bit more, link to my Patreon will be in the description. And up until the next video, have a flammable day. See ya.
das mal so, weil das ist immer so, wenn ich mit der Partie in der Liste zu gehen, hat sich nicht einmachen, und je weniger wir das machen, desto mehr auch wenn wir uns das Forum, die Empfehlung für den Verbraucher und wir den besten Wert immer zu nehmen und damit den Menschen sagen, was in diesem Kunden geschehen ist und wie man sich den Also ich glaube, der kleine Unterschied ist auf jeden Fall, die 